What is up you guys? Welcome back to the channel and welcome to another gruesome get ready with me video. If this is your first time seeing my face, welcome and better late than never. I guess. My name is Jessica and every week I sit down here and I talk about a true crime case whilst I put on some makeup. So if that sounds like it might be up your alley, I'd say subscribe, stick around, and join us back here each week. We're like super fun and we'd love to have you. All right, so have you guys ever been researching a case that you thought was a different case and then halfway through you're like, hey, wait a minute. Am I researching the completely wrong fucking case? No? Just me? Well, either way, fun fact, that is actually how this exact video came to be. I had a case in mind. I'd heard like a tiny snippet about it and I really quickly Googled the name or what I thought was the name, and I didn't even realize that I'd accidentally started researching this case instead of the case that I had initially set out to research. I truly don't know how I managed to get my wires crossed so badly, but in the end, both cases are really interesting and I'm gonna cover both of them anyway, so yeah. This one today and then the other one that I meant to research at first in like, I don't know, a week or two. But for today, let us dive into the case of Nicole Vanderheiden. Okay, so today's story brings us to the Manitowoc, Green Bay, Wisconsin area. And no, we are not talking about Stephen Avery, so please do not click out of this video. Contrary to what Netflix may have you believe, other things have taken place up there. So we're starting in Manitowoc. Manitowoc, Wisconsin is a city in Manitowoc County located in eastern Wisconsin. It sits on just over 18 square miles of land. And as of the 2020 census, the city of Manitowoc had a population of just under 35,000 people. That said though, back in the 1980s, the population sat closer to about 30,000. And that time frame is significant to our story today because that is when our central figure to today's case was born. Nicole Danielle Meyer, known as Nikki to those closest to her, was born on March 29th, 1985 to Steve and Vicki Meyer. Nikki was the oldest of the couple's four children. She was born just about a year or so after Steve and Vicky's wedding. And then after her birth, she was followed by her brother Brent, her sister Heather, and then finally her brother Brandon. And as far as I could tell, all four of the children, Nikki and her siblings, I believe they were all born and raised in Wisconsin. I'm not sure what Vicky did for a living, but I do know that Steve had his own chiropractic business in Green Bay. And from what I can tell, the Meyer family throughout Nikki's life was incredibly close. They were tight knit and they were super loving. Spending time together as a family, at least from what I can gather, seems to have been incredibly important to Steve and Vicky throughout Nicole's upbringing, especially time together outside. They were definitely what you would call outdoorsy. Hiking, gardening, going to the zoo, they were into all of it. It really just seems like they enjoyed the simple things in life. And Nikki carried all of this right into her adult life with her. She was always super into nature. She was into her health and into her spirituality. She was very like holistic, probably because she was raised by a chiropractor. But overall, Nikki just sounds like she was a beautiful, vibrant, and wonderful person. Those who knew her frequently describe her as magnetic with a beautiful smile and a loving and caring soul. And they also say that she just had a way of drawing people in and of making people feel comfortable around her. She was warm and kind and inviting and she just seemed to live every single day of her life to the absolute fullest extent possible. Nikki graduated from Denmark High School in Denmark, Wisconsin in 2003 before she then enrolled in the University of Wisconsin Green Bay, where she would ultimately graduate from in 2010 with a Bachelor of Science degree in Science and Education. She then took that degree and used it to secure a spot as a substitute teacher for the Green Bay Area public school system. And this was actually the job that she would hold right up until the very end of her life. Shortly after completing high school and towards the beginning of her college career, Nikki actually got married. She and her first husband tied the knot in 2005 when she was just 20. And then from there, they went on to have two children together, a little girl whom they named Michaela and a little boy whom they named Tyler. And if I can tell you anything about Nikki, it would be that, wow, she just absolutely adored 
those children. Nikki was an absolutely wonderful mother, and she loved her little babies more than words could ever even begin to describe. Unfortunately, though, the love that she and her husband shared in the years following becoming parents, well, that connection, sadly, started to deteriorate. I don't have a lot of details regarding what specifically went wrong in their relationship or what ultimately led to the end of it. Really, all I can tell you is that by 2012, the relationship had run its course and Nikki and her husband divorced. And contrary to what you might actually assume, Nikki had absolutely no interest in finding a new man or a new relationship or even casually dating following her divorce. Her children had always been and would continue to be her absolute top priority. So once her divorce was finalized, all Nikki really cared about and all she wanted to do was focus on herself and her kids and on creating like the best life that she possibly could for the three of them. And you know what? That was exactly what she went on to do for the next three years. Nikki didn't start dating again, at least not seriously, until around 2015. That is when she met a man named Doug Dietry. Now, I don't know if Nikki had any intention of she and Doug's relationship progressing quite as quickly as it did, but intentions aside, she and Doug fell incredibly hard and incredibly fast for one another. The two had met completely by chance at a bar called Jimmy C's in Alloway, Wisconsin. They met, they hit it off, and from there, you pretty much never saw one without the other. They seemed to be moving relatively fast as it was, but the seriousness of their relationship would intensify tenfold a few weeks in when Nikki discovered that she was pregnant. And while she and Doug had absolutely not plan to start a family together quite so soon, if they even discussed it at all. They still both seemed to really take the news well. They moved in together. They got a house in Green Bay. They talked about marriage, but they decided to wait until their baby was a little older. I mean, all in all, it seemed as though they were happy. They were excited, and from the outside looking in, things seemed to be going really, really well for them. Unfortunately, though, as we hear basically every week in these stories, things are most certainly almost never as they appear. And according to those closest to Nikki, she and Doug's relationship was no exception to this rhetoric. According to both Nikki's mom and Nikki's sister, Heather, Nikki had confided in them that Doug, uh, he wasn't like the best boyfriend, at least not all the time. According to Vicky and Heather, Nicole had told them of numerous different instances of Doug either losing his temper with her, becoming physical with her, and even instances of him just full on hitting her. So there was definitely trouble in paradise, I guess you could say. But in spite of that, the two did seem like they were trying their best to make things work with one another, especially considering they now had a baby on the way. Nikki gave birth to she and Doug's first baby, a son whom they named Dylan in late 2015. I think it was November. And just like with the birth of her first two children, Nikki and Dylan, it's like they were kindred spirits. Nikki loved being a mother more than anything. And the opportunity to have another healthy little baby, Nikki just felt like the luckiest mama in the world. Even if her life outside of her children wasn't exactly perfect, she never let herself get too down about it because she had her kids and that was really all that mattered to her. And that makes it all the more devastating to know that before Dylan could walk, before he could talk, or before he could honestly even form memories with Nikki, before he even turned one year old, his mother, Nikki Vanderheiden, she would be brutally and viciously taken from him, from his siblings, and from the world. And sadly, my friends, that brings us to the evening of May 20th, 2016. That night was one of the first nights since Dylan had been born that Nikki and Doug had arranged for a babysitter, and they were actually planning to go out with a few of their friends. Nikki was just six months postpartum at this point, and she was exclusively breastfeeding Dylan. And I can tell you from experience, during that early postpartum phase, it is so much easier to just not go out at all. It's way easier to just stay home and feed your baby than it is to pump and store milk and prep bottles and just, ugh, no thank you. It's not worth it. There is nothing I hate on earth quite as much as I hate strapping my titties into a breast pump. So 
The fact that Nikki hadn't felt up to going out all that much leading up to this point I can 100% understand. But this night was different. This night, she was ready to go out for a few hours, have a couple drinks, catch up with a couple friends, and just let loose. She had been cooped up in her house for the last six months, operating as a human pacifier. And that night, she was more than ready to get out and to have some fun. And you know what? The evening really did start out pretty decently. At least that's how it seems. Doug and Nikki and their friends started the evening by going to a bar in Green Bay called The Watering Hole. And while this bar has the typical, like, bar accoutrements, darts, pool, booze, it also has, like, an indoor sand volleyball court and an area where you could play horseshoes. Oh, and it also had live music. All of this overlooking, like, a pond or a lake or something right off the back patio. So... I mean, I've never been, but it sounds fun. Sounds at least slightly cooler than just like your average bar. And like I said, Nikki and Doug and their friends were initially having a good time. Things that evening didn't start to sour for the group, if you will, until some of Doug's old high school friends happened to waltz into the bar. Yeah, from there, the evening... um went downhill quick. From what I can gather, Doug basically completely ditched Nikki and their friends in order to talk to his high school friends, which is bad enough. I mean, I'd be pissed if my husband did that to me. But then on top of that faux pas, to make matters even worse, from Nikki's perspective, Doug seemed to be spending a lot of his time away from her and with his high school friends talking to a lady. Now, I wasn't there, so I can't refute or confirm if this was really how things were going down and I don't really think it matters. All that really matters is that that was Nikki's perception. She was there and whatever she was seeing, it did not make her feel um, good. She was pretty pissed off for a majority, if not the rest of the time, that she and the group of friends that she and Doug had initially gone out with stayed at the watering hole. And then when she and their friends decided to leave and head to a new bar, Doug decided that he'd rather stay behind with his high school friends. And I bet you can guess how that went over. Hint, not well. It was sometime around 11.30 that evening that Nikki and the group of friends she was with, they decided to leave the watering hole and move on to a bar called the Sardine Can. And obviously, as I just said, Doug had decided to hang back and not join them. And this led to the entire time that Nikki and Doug were separated at their respective bars. Nikki was feverishly and almost hysterically texting Doug. And while, yes, I'll be the first person to say up front that the texts that Nikki was sending to Doug, um, they weren't super becoming of her, but I will also defend her in saying that I've been postpartum before. I've been drunk before and I've been jealous before. And the thought of putting all of those feelings together into like a chaotic little bundle, not to mention that she's probably been real sober for close to like a year and a half at this point. I'm not saying that I excuse the things she said. I'm just saying that I can understand how she got worked up to the point where it seemed necessary in her state to say that. Texting things like, what bitch are you talking to? Or just sending texts that accused him directly of cheating or of being abusive or being controlling. She also called him numerous times, and I don't know what these phone calls really consisted of, like conversation-wise, but my assumption would be that it was much of the same as the text messages. However, Doug would later note that during these calls, Nikki was really drunk and that she wasn't making much if any sense. But regardless of that, things went on like this for the next 30, 45-ish minutes. It definitely wasn't much longer than that. At least I don't think that it was because just about an hour after Nikki and her friends had left the watering hole for the sardine can, Doug finally decided to tear himself away from his high school friends so that he could finally head over to meet up with Nikki at the sardine can. But by the time that he finally got there, Nikki... She wasn't there anymore. And at this point, you'd think, all right, I should probably go home and look for her. I mean, I'd assume that's what most significant others would do. But here's where you'll learn that Doug is not most significant others because instead he decided to continue on drinking with his good friend, Greg. He was not concerned in the slightest that Nikki wasn't at the bar anymore. He just figured that she gotten tired, decided to head home to relieve the babysitter and 
to turn in for the night. After all, like I said, she'd been pretty drunk. And I really hope that no one is going to try to fault her for anything that happened. Because for starters, she's a grown woman. If she wants to get downright shit face plastered, she should be able to do so without being concerned for her safety. The burden of her safety is not on her. It's on other people not to harm her. And two, even if she was drunk, as I previously mentioned, Nikki had spent close to the last year and a half relatively sober. So this meant that she probably didn't have the alcohol tolerance that night that she once had. There's every chance in the world that she had no intention of getting as intoxicated that night as she did. And that's what kind of bugs me about the fact that Doug didn't try to check on her and didn't try to get a hold of her. I don't know, maybe I'm just anxious or over the top or what have you, but when I know my husband is out somewhere drinking, I check in with him periodically just to make sure everything's okay and that I don't have anything to worry about, make sure he doesn't need a ride. And uh, I mean, I'm a homebody, I don't go nowhere, I don't do nothing, but I would hope that if I did, he would do the same. Because sure, well, as long as people are drinking responsibly, i.e. not driving or endangering others, I don't think there's anything wrong with having some drinks. That said though, it's irrefutable that when someone's drinking, it inherently does increase the likelihood that something could happen to them. Your inhibitions are lowered, you're in a more vulnerable state, then you would be sober. And sure, people shouldn't take advantage of that. But the harsh reality of the world is that there are people out there that will. So as her significant other, her partner and the father of her child, I'm sorry, but I think that once he realized that Nikki wasn't where he expected her to be, that he should have decided to end his night and go home to make sure that she had arrived there safely. Call me old fashioned, call me a ball buster, call me whatever you want. I'm not saying you have to agree with me. I'm just saying that that's what I would do in Doug's situation. And that's what I would hope that my husband would also do. But as I've well established by now, Doug did not seek Nikki out any further, and instead he settled into the sardine can with his friend Greg to indulge in a few more drinks. Actually, they went ahead and kept on drinking for like an hour, hour and a half after they realized that Nikki was no longer at the bar. Greg didn't end up getting Doug home until sometime just before 3 a.m., technically on May 21st. So color Doug surprised when he found out that Nicole, in fact, had not ever made it home. Nikki's two older children had been at their father's for the night, but as I mentioned earlier, they had arranged for a babysitter to come and watch Dylan. And Doug was shocked when he pulled up to his house to see that the babysitter's car was still there. He immediately went inside and he asked the babysitter what on earth she was still doing there. Whew, sorry, shit just almost really hit the fan with these eyes, but I fixed it, so... Where were we? Oh yeah, Doug, he gets home, he goes inside immediately, and he asks the babysitter, what is she still doing there? Has she heard from Nicole? Has Nicole stopped by the house at all? What's the sitch? But unfortunately, the babysitter, she didn't have any answers for Doug. All she was aware of up to that point was that Doug and Nicole had been out. She had no idea that they'd fought, that they'd split up while they'd been out that evening, and most unnerving, she had not seen or heard from Nicole since she and Doug had initially left the house for the watering hole. Now, Doug claims that initially he wasn't all that worried about this. He still just figured that Nicole was out and that she'd be home later when she decided she wasn't mad at him anymore. He told the babysitter she could go ahead on home and then he proceeded to tuck himself into bed to sleep off the evening. And while like, sure, maybe? Here's my problem with that. Wisconsin state law requires the bars close between the hours of 2 and 6 a.m. on weekdays and 2.30 and 6 a.m. on weekends. So I don't know what kind of fucking underground law-breaking bar Doug thought Nicole was at, but I don't think you'll be surprised to learn that she was not still out drinking. Devastatingly, she would not be home in a few more hours, and she'd actually never be home again. And y'all, Doug must be like the chillest dude on the planet. He didn't worry when Nikki wasn't at the sardine can. He didn't wig out when she wasn't home when he got there at 3 a.m. And to top it off, 
He didn't even bat an eyelash when he woke up at 6.30 to feed and soothe their crying son. And Nikki still wasn't there. And I'm sorry, this, that's where I'm like, nope. No matter what he says, this should have been a mega red flag moment. If you've ever breastfed a baby, you know just as well as I do that your entire life revolves around feeding that baby. Breastfeeding dictates so much of your life when you're doing it. It dictates how long you can be out of the house. It dictates what you can eat. It dictates medications you can take. It even dictates like topical skincare treatments. For the duration that you're doing it, breastfeeding really does become like your entire personality. Oh, it's just such a magical time. So to think that Nikki would voluntarily miss a feeding when her entire world revolved around not just breastfeeding, but being a mother in general? Absolutely not. I mean, I've made it painfully clear that I think alarm bells should have been raised way before this, but in my opinion, this should have been the absolute last straw. Yet, Doug drug himself out of bed, fed the baby, and then flung himself right back in bed. Not a care in the world that his girlfriend was still completely unaccounted for. It wasn't until Nicole had been unaccounted for for close to 20 hours that Doug was finally like, hmm, maybe something is actually amiss here. Yeah, Doug didn't call the police until 4.30 in the afternoon on May 21st. And he hasn't seen her like in person since 11.30 the previous evening. Yeah, they'd been fighting and yeah, he'd made an ass of himself the night before. And yeah, maybe at first it was reasonable to believe that Nikki just needed some space and some time to cool off. But I am baffled that he would have believed for even a second that Nikki would have put her anger for him above the love she had for her children. Sir, you ain't all that, but I digress. At least he did finally call. I guess. He called the police non-emergency line, like I said, around 4.30. And when the dispatcher answered, Doug calmly asked, uh, how do I go about, uh, I guess, a missing person? Yeah, that's an exact quote. <laughs> Clearly, he was still not thinking that this was like a dire situation. He's just cool as a cucumber. He called the non-emergency line. I think he really just expected that, you know, Everything was gonna work out just fine. And word on the street is that that's just kind of how Doug was. He came from a well-off family and he never really got in too much trouble throughout his life. He'd kind of just grown accustomed to things working out for him. At least that's what I've seen implied. So police make their way out to Doug and Nikki's to take his formal statement. They knock, he opens the door and right away, police notice a couple of things about our old buddy Doug. First of all, he appears incredibly hungover, which, I mean, that tracks. However, the second thing they noted was that Doug, prior to them arriving, had clearly just taken a shower. And they thought this was odd because, like I said, it was obvious that the shower had taken place very shortly before their arrival. As in, like, in between his 911, or I guess not even 911 call, but in between his call to police and them arriving. And they thought that was weird. Your girlfriend is missing you know police are headed to your house. Why are you gonna hop in the shower now? Like clearly there are more pressing things at play here than your BO. Personally, I find taking a shower incredibly overstimulating. So I for one will almost certainly find any possible excuse I can to push off what to me feels like a monumental task. But I don't know, I guess y'all have to chime in down below. Do you think Doug taking a shower while he waited for police was weird or like were they just clenching onto the whole, it's always the spouse thing, too hard, too fast. Because regardless of what you or I think, they were absolutely giving Doug and his shower the side eye. Either way though, they sat down with him in he and Nikki's kitchen and they listened very closely as he relayed to them everything from the night before. Well, almost everything. He definitely altered his story, in my opinion, to make him look a little less douchey. Like he told police most everything I've already told you, but he did fudge the numbers a bit. He told them that once he and Greg got to the sardine can and saw that Nikki wasn't there, that they immediately left and headed home to see if she was there. You're a fibber, fibber. Which of course we already know is a big fat lie. We know that they stayed and they closed down the bar that night. Meaning that with this one little lie, 
Doug had effectively altered the timeline of that evening by close to like two, two and a half hours. It's not a good look, Doug. It is it's not a good look. Of course, at the time, police didn't know that Doug was fibbing. That wouldn't come to light for them until later. But for now, they had enough reason to want to pause the interview and to resume it with Doug down at the police station. You know, more of a controlled environment. Don't get me wrong, he wasn't being arrested or detained or anything like that. They just wanted him to accompany them down to the station so that they could get a more in-depth and accurate conversation on the record. Nothing more, nothing less. And Doug happily agreed to this interview. He felt as though he didn't have anything to hide. So he was more than willing to do whatever they needed of him. But before we get into that, I'm going to take my break, throw on my lashes, and when we get back, Doug's interrogation. Don't go nowhere. All right, so we're back, we're lash-tastic, and we're ready to get back into the story. Before our break, Doug had been asked by police to submit to a formal interview down at the station, which he had no issues with. He met them at the station, he reiterated his story yet again, and he gave police a very detailed and very in-depth description of Nikki and what she looked like and what she'd been wearing the night before when he'd last seen her. Right down to the pink wristband that she had been given at the bar in order to quickly signify to staff that she was of legal drinking age. All in all, Doug ended up at the station speaking to police for I think like three hours. However, it was about the two hour mark that police dropped a mega bombshell on Doug. You see, as all of this had been going on with him, waking up, reporting Nikki missing, showering, talking to police, just three miles from he and Nikki's home, a completely separate group of police officers had been dispatched to a farm in response to a truly horrifying discovery. It was around 1.30 in the afternoon that same day, May 21st, 2016. This was before Doug had called police, before he'd reported Nikki missing. This was probably before he'd even woke up for the day. A frantic call came into Green Bay Police. The call was from a local farmer, and he was calling to report that while out and working on his farm that day, he had discovered what he believed to be a human body. He couldn't tell the dispatcher much about it. I guess he'd been pretty far away from it. He was like up a hill and looking down onto it from where he was. He actually couldn't even say with confidence whether or not he believed the body belonged to a man or to a woman. All he knew was that it appeared he'd found a body and he was not going anywhere closer to it. Basically, all he could really make out was that the body, which by the way was face down, whomever it was, they had long blonde hair and that was pretty much all he was able to relay over the call. Following this call, police made their way out to the farm right away. Mind you, they were unaware of Nikki's disappearance at this point. So when they got to the scene and they began doing their preliminary exam, they were operating as if they had a doe, a Jane Doe specifically. Once they had arrived to the scene and turned the body over, they were quickly able to determine that it was that of a young woman. And as if discovering the dead body of a young woman abandoned on some farmland wasn't awful enough. When they turned this body over, it became immediately evident to police that this woman, she had been absolutely brutalized. Just from their vantage point and from like a cursory once over, they could see that this woman had been like savagely beaten. She'd been strangled. She had a shoe print on her back, meaning that her killer had quite literally stomped on her. I mean, it was just barbaric what this woman had been through. Not to mention that given her state of undress, it was also incredibly likely and later confirmed that she had been violated as well. This poor woman was completely nude and her clothes weren't even anywhere at the scene. It appeared as though all that remained of whatever she had last been wearing was a sock that somehow had managed to remain partially on one of her feet, as well as a small pink paper wristband that adorned her left wrist. Yes, as I'm sure you've likely guessed or pieced together by now, tragically, this was in fact the body of 31-year-old mother of three, Nicole Danielle Vanderheiden. Like I said, it was at about the two hour mark of Doug's interview with police that they finally revealed this information to him. They explained to him that they had found the body of a young woman and that while they would still need to definitively identify her, tentatively speaking, they were fairly certain given the matching descriptions 
right down to that pink bracelet, it, it was almost certain that it was Nicole that they'd found. And hearing this, Doug was a mess. He was visibly shocked, visibly shaken, and he was just very clearly devastated. He broke down into tears almost immediately, and he was very openly emotional with police. And although they were watching this, at this point, he's still their number one suspect. The boyfriend, husband, partner, spouse, they're always the first suspect. Well, actually, I guess technically speaking, the farmer was the first person that they looked at and cleared in relation to Nikki's death, but they were able to do this really quickly. They were able to compare tire tracks that were at the scene to tire tracks on the two vehicles that the farmer had. One was a skid steer and one was a four-wheeler, and neither sets of tires appeared to match the set that was found near Nikki, so it was a pretty quick turnaround in clearing the farmer. Like, I'm pretty sure they'd ruled him out before the body was even known to be Nikki and before they even knew who Doug was. But once those pieces are in place, victim's identity and their significant other's identity, that is when the significant other immediately falls under heavy scrutiny. Even when the person appears to be an absolute heaven-sent angel, they are still the first person that police look into. So you can only begin to imagine the suspicion they had surrounding Doug when they found out through some of Nicole's text messages that she considered him to be like, that does not look good for someone when their partner ends up brutally murdered. Police were pretty certain, straight from the start of their investigation, that Doug was going to turn out to be their guy. I mean, in their mind, he had to be, right? They just needed to prove it. Ooh, and the sooner they could do so, the better, because this crime had the people of Green Bay straight bugging. Overall, Green Bay is, at least from my understanding, like a super safe place to live. They have a relatively low crime rate in comparison to the rest of the US, and their rate of violent crime, even lower than that. So hearing that an innocent young woman had been so brutally murdered and the culprit was still at large, understandably, this had people really concerned for their own safety. I mean, I hate to harp on it, but Nicole had not just been killed. She had been absolutely brutalized. Her autopsy revealed upwards of 250 injuries, hundreds of blunt force injuries, a decent portion of which were on her face and head. She'd been raped, she'd been strangled, and she'd been left abandoned in a field like she didn't matter. A lot of times we see like absolute savagery like this in cases classified as overkill. And a lot of investigators believe that the evidence of overkill suggests that the perpetrator knew the victim. Which brings us right back to Doug. Police were hot and heavy on that man like flies on shit. They dug into his background, his cell phone data, his timeline of the night Nikki was killed, and I'm here to tell you, ain't none of it make him look great. I barely even know where to start. I guess I'll start with the fact that they found out that Doug had, um juxtaposed his timeline of the night of May 20th slash the morning of May 21st by damn near three hours. That didn't sit well with him, nor did the accusations that Nikki had made via texts that Doug was abusive. Strike two. Oh, also in his phone, police found evidence that Doug might not have been as happy in his relationship as he would have liked them to believe. Specifically, they stopped dead in their tracks at a message that they found that Doug had sent to his mother that said, Something along the lines of, I'm very seriously thinking about telling Nikki and the kids that they have to move out. I'm not cut out for this life one bit. They also had a super fun conversation with one of Doug's other ex-girlfriends who claimed that he was very aggressive and controlling throughout their relationship as well. She told police that when the two of them would get into arguments, Doug would not hesitate to yell, scream, curse, spit. One time she said he even broke her ankle, roughing her up during a fight, so... Doug is looking, he's looking really, really bad. Don't worry though, because it's only going to get worse. Not only did a Green Bay officer happen upon some of Nikki's discarded belongings right near her house, just a couple of days after her body was found, but a search of Nikki and Doug's actual home and property. Listen, spoiler alert, Doug is not guilty, but what I will tell you is that he is unlucky. Or 
lucky, I guess, depending on how you want to look at how this all plays out. Because like I said, he's innocent of murder. I still don't think he's a stellar guy, but that's neither here nor there at the moment. The point is that Doug did not kill Nikki, but he sure as shit was like this fucking close to going down for it. Okay, so they found her clothes, phone, purse, and underwear all on the side of the road, only like a mile away from where Nikki was found. And I think it was heading in the direction of she and Doug's house. So basically it looked like he had dumped her body at the farm and then on his way back to the house, threw all of her shit out of the car in an effort to try and distance himself from all that evidence. Then back at the house, they found blood in the garage. They found blood and dirt in Nikki's car. They found blood on a pair of Doug's shoes that happened to have soles that resembled the shoe print found on Nikki. And then when police were literally in the middle of their own search of the house and surrounding property, they were approached by a neighbor of Nikki and Doug's who just wanted to let them know that they had found some suspicious stuff, if you will. Apparently while out mowing his lawn, the neighbor had found two electrical cords, like phone charging cables, and they had found blood on their curb. Then last, but certainly not least, they had also found freshly ripped out blonde hair. And basically what all of this evidence eventually amalgamated to, God, I love that word, amalgamate. Sorry, basically what all of that evidence came together to form um, was Doug's arrest. I mean, can you blame him? That is a lot of circumstantial and physical evidence. I mean, we've seen cases where people are convicted on way less. Angel Bumpus comes to mind initially, but I'm sure there's like, thousands of others. So Doug was arrested on May 23rd, 2016 under suspicion of murder. And basically while in limbo waiting for DNA and forensics to come back, police were kind of just sitting back thinking they had their guy. Well, their guys. Yeah, he was never formally arrested, but police did really lean on Doug's friend Greg during his interview because they were convinced that he was somehow an accomplice in Nikki's murder. So initially police were theorizing that Doug and Nikki had gotten into some sort of fight outside of their house after they had both come home from the bar that night slash morning. They were thinking they fought, Doug killed, or at least incapacitated her there. He loaded her into her car because he had left his car at the watering hole all night. So they figured he used her car to transport her body from their house to the farm where she was ultimately found. And this theory would explain pretty much all of the evidence they had. The evidence outside the home, the blood in the garage, the dirt in Nikki's car, all of it. The problem was that after reviewing Nikki's car's GPS system, police discovered that Nikki's car had not moved at all the night she was killed. And without a car of his own, how would Doug have gotten Nikki to the farm? Greg. At least that's what police were thinking. So they called him in for an interview. And once they had him where they wanted him, they laid it on thick with two C's. They told him that his story sounded rehearsed, that his alibi was bullshit. And they were just really hard on him. I'll leave it at that. To the point where partway through the interview, Greg just bounced. They asked him, in his opinion, one too many pointed questions. And eventually he was like, you know what? Screw this. Screw this. Screw you. I'm done. And he just waltzed on out. Luckily for him though, and obviously luckily for Doug as well, after police arrested Doug and started really putting their case together, <laughs> oh girl, did it fall apart even quicker than it had come together. Okay, so for starters, all the blood that they had found at the house, not Nikki's. The blood they had found outside on the curb was, but the blood they had found inside the garage and inside her car, not hers. Yeah, the blood in her car ended up being from one of her kids, I assume from just a minor like kid accident. And then the blood they found in the garage, turkey blood, yeah. Turkey blood, as in blood from a turkey, not a human. As for the spot on Doug's shoes that they thought was blood, that came back inconclusive from the lab. And as far as finding Doug's DNA on Nikki or around where her body had been discovered, they couldn't. They sent away every item of Nikki's that they could offer for DNA analysis. I think they sent things off in like batches of 10 or something like that. And each time they got results back, 
It was always the same. Doug was not a match. They were able to pull some male DNA off of Nikki. However, it was not enough for them to enter into CODIS to try and find a match. So as their case against Doug was falling apart, they also started to realize that they were basically going to be starting from square one again. They had very little to go off of. Really all they had left was to continue sending off whatever they could from the crime scene in hopes of eventually getting a significant DNA match. But suffice it to say that their case against Doug, it twas no more. He actually ended up being released from custody just shy of three weeks after his arrest. And then for the next few weeks, it was basically crickets. They did think they were onto something for like, a hot second when they were reviewing CCTV footage from the bars Nikki was at the night she was killed. And they stumbled across footage of a guy following her out of the sardine can. And it kind of looked like they were arguing, which to police's credit, they were, but it was quickly discovered that the guy was actually a friend of Nikki's just trying to help her get an Uber home. And I guess she was mad at him. I think given her argument with Doug and her state of inebriation, she was probably just operating with a pretty short fuse in general that evening. Nevertheless, though, it didn't take police very long to rule this man out as a potential person of interest. And then from there, there was very little movement on Nikki's case for like, two months. Yes, my friends, that is how long it took them to finally send in the one piece of evidence recovered from the scene that would just so happen to break the case wide open. And believe it or not, that piece of evidence, police's golden ticket, if you will, was Nikki's sock. The one article of clothing that had somehow managed to remain on her body when she was dumped on the farm, that was the thing that police recovered that actually had enough DNA from the perpetrator for police to enter into CODIS in hopes of finding a match. And so they sent the sample off, they crossed their fingers, held their breath, and they waited. And when the results came in, against all odds, they got a hit. The DNA from Nikki's sock had come back as a match to that of 38-year-old George Stephen Birch. Originally from Virginia, it did not take police long looking into Birch for them to feel as though they were definitely on the right track. Not only was Birch a convicted felon, but he'd also been arrested and tried for a different murder back in 1997. And while he was acquitted of that crime, it's still disconcerting. At the time of Nikki's murder, George was actually still supposed to be in Virginia on probation in regards to a grand larceny charge. But at the beginning of 2016, he decided that he didn't really care about that. And so he decided to up and move to Green Bay. So yeah, not only was he a complete and total stranger to Nikki, never met her a day before in her life until that fateful night, but legally speaking, he shouldn't have even been in Wisconsin at the time she was killed. If Virginia had been conducting his probation properly, he should have been damn near a thousand miles away. But clearly that was not the case. So now they needed to start building a case up against George, preferably without tipping him off that they were trying to do so. I mean, he's already absconded probation once, so who's to say that he's not gonna flee if he catches wind that he's the center of another murder investigation? Luckily, while pursuing Birch's legal history, police just so happened to stumble across pretty much the perfect way in. A way to question Birch and get some information from him to hopefully link him to the crime without really letting him know that that's what was going on. Let me explain. You see, what had happened was while the Brown County Sheriff's homicide detectives were looking into Nikki's murder, a different group of officers was investigating a completely, to them at the time, unrelated crime. It was a hit and run accident that involved a Chevy S10 Blazer that was registered to, you guessed it, George Birch. And George had been questioned about this prior to police having any clue that he could possibly be responsible for what happened to Nikki. And at the time he claimed that he wasn't involved in the accident because his car had been stolen. And I don't really know too much about what was going on with that whole case beyond that point. But what I do know is that when he had initially talked to police about his blazer and about the hit and run, he had given them a fully signed broad scope consent form allowing them to search his phone. And that meant that right there, within their very own department's files lie basically a complete data dump of their suspect's cell phone. And they didn't even have to ask for it. They had 
everything, starting with text messages and photos and ending with emails and location data. This meant that they were able to view via his Google dashboard every single movement that George Birch had made the night that Nikki was killed. And that information came together to form the exact picture you would think it would. From a bar right near the sardine can, to Nikki's house, to the farm, and then back to his own residence. Leading police to theorize that George and Nikki had met at a little local bar near the sardine can. They assumed that Nikki had headed there after she'd gotten into the fight with that one friend of hers who was trying to get her an Uber. They think she walked from the sardine can to the other bar, ran into Birch, and because she was a kind and inviting person, the two struck up a conversation, maybe even had a few laughs. And then when it came time for the two of them to part ways, somehow George ended up giving Nikki a ride home. A ride that he expected to be compensated for sexually. Sidebar, can we please start teaching our sons, and I say this as a mother of sons, we have got to start teaching these soon to be men that women do not owe them anything, especially their bodies just because you do them a small favor. I mean, Jesus, what kind of Stone Age Neanderthal type thinking is that? And when Nikki declined these advances, Spurch, likely drunk and clearly uncivilized, decided that he wasn't gonna let that fly. So in a blue bald rage, he attacked Nikki, attacked her, raped her and killed her right outside her very own home, just yards away from where her tiny, little baby slept. Yards away from where her boyfriend, who would almost be blamed for her untimely demise, slept off his night of drinking. Yards away from the home that she had intended to spend her life in with her family. 118 feet to be exact. I cannot even begin to imagine how terrible that must have been for Nikki to be able to see her home, to see her safe space, to be so close and yet so far away. Oh God. And to think that her baby was in there and that she likely knew she was never going to get to see him again. I cannot even begin to imagine the thoughts that were racing through her head as she fought tooth and nail for her life. And even if I try to, it makes the hair on the back of my neck stand on end. To think of what a helpless feeling that must have been. I mean, Nikki was petite. She'd been drinking. She was a healthy person, sure. And she was strong. She fought like hell that night, but George Birch is six foot eight, pushing 300 pounds. And once he'd made up his mind, Nikki, she didn't stand a chance. And as soon as Birch was done with her, he hoisted her back into his car. He drove her to the farm, ditched her belongings along the highway on the way, then drove off into the field on the farm where he discarded Nikki as if she was nothing. Oh, and before I forget, they did end up comparing George's tire tracks from his blazer to the ones found near Nikki's body. And as I'm sure will surprise no one, they were a perfect match. George Birch was arrested on September 7th, 2016 and charged with the first degree murder of Nikki Vander Hayden. Of course, he pleaded not guilty to the charges, therefore taking the case to trial. I mean, he'd been acquitted of one murder, why not try again? You know? And as if taking a seemingly slam dunk case to trial wasn't a big enough gamble, y'all, this man also decided to testify on his own behalf. Yeah, it, it, it didn't go well. Not only was his story of what took place that evening preposterous, but he also came across as argumentative, aggressive, and I don't know. He just came across as the type of guy that might not think twice about killing a woman because she turned down his giant ass for sex. Although, according to George, that is absolutely not what had happened that night. No, according to George, Nikki was actually super into him. I mean, who wouldn't be? Peep that ponytail. <laughs> no, uh, George claimed that Nikki had come onto him and that the sex that they had had outside of her house that night had been completely consensual. Yeah, George got on the stand in the courtroom, swore on a Bible to tell the truth, and then in front of... Jesus and everybody proceeded to spout off the biggest hot garbage lie feasibly possible for one human to come up with in their brain hole. Yes, George claimed dead seriously, might I add, that he and Nikki had met at the little bar near the sardine can and the two of them had immediately hit it off. They were drinking together, talking, flirting, and then as the evening progressed, they eventually left the bar and headed back to Nikki's. Then once they were there, they parked, they had sex, consensually of course, that part he vividly remembered. However, beyond that, according to George, everything went black. It wasn't until he came back to a few minutes later that his memory 
kicks back in and he can remember more of the evening. Y'all, this man in his little suit and tie and his ponytail tried to convince the jury that while he was in the middle of having sex with Nikki, someone had come out of nowhere, opened his car door and pistol whipped him in the back of the head, rendering him unconscious. Hmm. But who on earth would do this? You might be wondering. Well, Doug, of course. George's story was that Doug had busted he and Nikki having sex in the car, knocked him out with a gun, then murdered Nikki while he slept on the curb. So he's claiming that by the time he regained consciousness, Nikki was already dead. She'd been beaten to death at the hands of her boyfriend, Doug Dietry. The same man who George claims then held him at gunpoint and forced him to load Nikki's body into his car and drive her to the farm. And when asked why he didn't immediately report this incident to police once he'd safely escaped Doug, because, you know, rather than killing him too, Doug had apparently not only enlisted him in helping conceal a murder, but he'd also let him go free afterwards. He'd trusted this complete stranger to keep his massive secret. A trust that George claims he honored because he was worried about facing the consequences of having violated his parole back in Virginia. So instead he kept Doug's secret and he proceeded onward with his life as if nothing noteworthy had happened that night. Shoot, he even made it to the little fishing trip he had planned with his friends just mere hours later. Here's a picture they were able to pull from his phone to prove it. Really looks like a man who's been assaulted, held at gunpoint and forced to conceal a body just hours earlier. I mean, if that was true, the man should write a book because he'd be handling trauma better than anyone I've ever heard of. Obviously though, his story is clearly b -b -b bullshit, which now the prosecution had the task of proving. Isn't it ironic how they went from trying to prove that Doug was guilty to now having to prove that he was innocent? And this actually turned out to be pretty easy once they realized that Doug religiously wore his Fitbit. Yeah, this gift, ironically from Nikki herself, actually turned out to be the strongest piece of evidence that the prosecution had in Doug's favor. Much like they were able to use George's location data to bury him, they were able to use Doug's Fitbit steps and location data to clear him. According to the Fitbit data, Doug had taken precisely zero steps at the time that he was supposedly pistol whipping George and murdering Nikki. And <laughs> when confronted with this and seeing his desperate attempt at freedom crumble before his very eyes, that is when George started to get kind of combative and argumentative on the stand. Something that juries never tend to look favorably on. It's actually one of the many, many, many reasons that attorneys typically don't love for their defendants to take the stand in the first place. Because by agreeing to do so, more often than not, all you're doing is opening yourself up to the possibility that shit's gonna go sideways for you real quick. All in all, George's trial lasted for eight days. And after closing arguments, the jury deliberated for a cool crisp three hours before returning to the courtroom with their verdict. On Friday, March 2nd, 2018, George Stephen Birch was found guilty by a jury of his peers of the first degree intentional homicide of 31 year old mother of three, Nicole Danielle Vander Heiden. At his sentencing hearing, Nikki's family, friends, and those closest to her spoke in memory of her for over two hours, delivering victim impact statements and condemning George Birch for the horrific things he had done to their beloved Nikki. Contrary to that though, for George, not a single person showed up to speak on his behalf. Although Judge John Zakowski definitely had some words for him. Before handing down George's sentence, Judge Zankowski stated, quote, the manly thing would have been to say, I did it. I flipped out, I did whatever. Cop a plea, do something and step up to the plate. You chose not to do that and you still haven't done that. To drop a body off in a field and then 12 hours later go on a boat and be smiling like nothing happened, like you didn't have a care in the world. How can we explain that? That isn't human, that isn't normal. This is the most brutal murder that has ever been committed by one person in the history of Brown County. That's how severe this case is. This is a crime that I believe would merit the death penalty. And for that, you have to die in prison. Now, despite what Judge Zankowski said about George's crime warranting the death penalty in Wisconsin, that simply was not an option. The maximum sentence that could be imposed on George for what he'd been convicted of was life in prison without the possibility of parole, which is exactly what he was given. But despite the fact that George had been lucky enough to walk away with his life, the same of which could not be said for Nikki, that just 
it wasn't good enough for him. And as soon as he got the chance, he and his legal team pursued an appeal. George attempted to appeal his conviction on the grounds that his Fourth Amendment rights had been violated when the location data from his cell phone had been admitted into trial. Oh, and on top of that, he also argued that the data from Doug's Fitbit shouldn't have been allowed in in the way that it was, given that there were no experts called to testify to the reliability of that specific technology. What's funny about that though, I mean, funny is probably not the right word because none of this is funny, but what's ironic about his his arguments there is that those weren't even the factors that really like clinched the jury's verdict. Yeah, when later interviewed, some of the jurors told reporters that their decision had mostly come down to the charging cord that Doug's neighbor had turned into the police. They said that the fact that George and Nikki's DNA was present on it, but Doug's wasn't, that was what had sealed George's fate for them not the evidence he was trying to have eradicated. Honestly, it didn't matter though, because ultimately it was determined that there was no law enforcement misconduct used in obtaining the information that would warrant the exclusion of that stuff in the trial. So thankfully, 46 year old George Stephen Birch to this day continues to sit and rot in prison where he belongs. And while I wish I could say that that was the end of the story, unfortunately, it's not. And that is because George's trial was not the only legal nightmare the Nikki's family had to endure. And the second issue, well, this one was Doug's fault. I'll make this brief because I know this video is getting long, but apparently this all took place like nine-ish months after Nikki had been killed. Nikki's sister, Heather, actually moved in temporarily with Doug into the house that he'd shared with Nikki so that she could help him take care of Dylan. I have to imagine that Doug hadn't anticipated at any point that he'd be Dylan's only parent. And I'm sure this left him incredibly overwhelmed and frankly, in over his head after Nikki's death. So that is why Heather moved in to help ease him through the transition. The issue though came shortly thereafter when Heather and Doug were in the car together. They were headed home from a friend's birthday party when Doug kind of tried to put the moves on her. And Heather understandably was disgusted by this. She simply asked Doug to please not. I mean, Nikki hadn't even been dead a year. Heather had no interest in Doug and she just found the entire exchange incredibly inappropriate because it was. But rather than realizing like, hey, maybe she's right. Maybe this is tacky and I shouldn't be hitting on my recently murdered girlfriend's sister. Doug instead got irate and proceeded to put the pedal to the metal and drive erratically and fast all while Heather begged him to stop and begged him to let her out. Doug refused though, and he just kept driving, paying no mind to traffic laws or traffic lights. And obviously this made Heather feel as though she could be in real danger. Thankfully though, as Heather eventually started screaming and kicking at the windshield of Doug's car, he did finally ease the vehicle to a stop and let her out. Obviously she reported this to police immediately, leading to Doug's arrest and subsequent charge of second degree reckless endangerment, false imprisonment and negligent operation of a vehicle. So two felonies and a misdemeanor. He pled no contest to all three charges and was ultimately convicted of solely the negligent driving charge. And I guess this was after the prosecution and the defense came to an agreement that the judgment on the felonies could be withheld at least for the time being. So Doug ended up being fined a thousand dollars and he was instructed to stay out of trouble and to stay out of bars for like, I think it was a year and a half ish. It was until October of 2019. And as long as he obeyed those rules, the felonies were set to be dismissed by 2020. And while I can't say for certain, I guess he managed to hold it together throughout that time frame because I didn't see anything that insinuated otherwise. Still though, ew, Doug. If you've been wondering why I've been a little harsh perhaps on Doug throughout this video, it, it's that. That's why. Like, yeah, he didn't kill Nikki, but he still kind of sucks. Given his ex-girlfriend whose ankle he broke, Nikki's accusations that he was abusive to her, and then what went on to happen between him and Heather. Like I get that he was grieving through that last one, but it's still not an excuse. And he clearly needs some sort of counseling or anger management, at least in my opinion. And shoot, with his volatile ass temper, he is lucky as hell the DNA proved that he was innocent in Nikki's case. Cause it would have been really easy without the DNA to convince a jury that He'd been a jilted lover who'd murdered his girlfriend after an alcohol-induced argument. It is crazy to think about how easily people could potentially be wrongfully charged, imprisoned, or even put to death if we didn't have the technology available to us that we do. And I mean, shit, people are still wrongfully charged, imprisoned, and put to death, but just imagine how much higher those numbers would be without like DNA science and forensics and stuff to fall back on. It's, ugh, it's just crazy to think about. Anyways, rest in peace to poor Nikki. She 
had her whole life ahead of her and her children's whole lives. And uh, Birch knew that and he still chose to take her life from her. And for what? Sex one time? Grow the fuck up. Now three children have to grow up without a mother all because this oversized man baby couldn't stand the idea of going home and tending to himself, himself. It is sickening. Like I said, please teach your sons out there that women do not owe them their bodies as repayment for a favor. And ugh, parents of daughters, please teach them the dangers of this world and how to be as safe as possible. And everyone, make sure you hug your loved ones and never take a single day with them for granted. Because nothing in this life is ever guaranteed, least of all a tomorrow. And with that, you guys, we are about wrapped for today. Let me know your thoughts on this case in the comments down below. As always, I thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video and to listen to this story. If you have a case or a topic you'd like to see me cover, please fill out the request submission form that I have linked in the description. And if you're also into the makeup aspect of these videos, I will make sure to have the details and the links for everything I use throughout today's video listed down there as well. If you haven't already and you'd like to, go ahead and subscribe to my channel. I put out new videos almost every week, but if you turn on your post notifications, you'll always be notified when I do post and you'll always be sure to catch me back here in my next one. But until then, stay safe and have a good week. Bye. I had a case in mind. I'd heard like a tiny snippet about it. What is with the brush? <laughs> she would, where she would ultimately, oh, fuck. <laughs> okay, hello. <clears throat> head over to the sark your inhibitions are lowered your animal yeah your inhibition are my inhibitions lowered and when the dispatch yeah <laughs> what is going on with this ew i'm gonna need you to puff back up there friend jesus gross <laughs> right down to the pink race That, ah, no. This is the loudest beauty blender in the whole world. Did I put blush on? Oh, what am I doing?